Right, a reminder for announcements of Camp Arete coming up on July 14th or 20th, and then Vacation Bible School July 22nd or 24th. Please contact Mark Friedrich if you're interested in helping. Uh, they do need some volunteers, so continue to pray for both of those uh, outreach ministry efforts. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension shall defend your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we begin our study this evening, we'll have a few moments of silent prayer. We take time to prepare ourselves spiritually because we are to be walking by the Spirit, enjoying our fellowship with God. But when we sin, that ongoing rapport with God is broken. And so to recover, we confess sin, which means to admit or acknowledge our sin. And instantly God forgives us of those sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So after a few moments of silent prayer, then I will, uh, I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, what a wonderful thing it is to know that we are part of your royal family and that we can pray to you with intimacy indicated by calling you Abba, our Father. Father, we're thankful that you have given us a salvation that is free, that we, a salvation that is complete and total, that G Jesus Christ paid it all on the cross. There's nothing we can add to it. It is sufficient. It is enough. It's more than enough. It has taken care of the penalty for every human being, and it has solved the sin problem. Nevertheless, we still sin, and we need to come to you and, if necessary, confess sin so that we can be restored to that ongoing fellowship. And Father, we know that we must be more mindful of walking closely with the Spirit so that we can grow and mature, and that our worship will be uh, valuable and significant for eternity. Father, tonight I want to pray for a couple of pastors. We pray for uh, Dan Ingram as he's uh, fighting cancer. We pray that uh, the doctors will be able to devise a therapy that will, um, that will solve the problem and put the cancer in complete remission. Father, we also pray for Dick Berg, who's uh, co-pastor now of the church where he's pastored for many years, and for Collins and... Uh, this time he's in the hospital, and we pray uh, as he deals with a lot of uh, significant health problems that you would uh, that he'd be a great witness for you in the hospital. And we also pray for Brad Maston, who is the young new young pastor there, that you would strengthen and encourage him as they go through this tra transition for a church that's had a pastor for so many years. Father, we pray for us tonight as we focus upon your word, that as your word strengthens us, as it washes us, as it uh, gives us knowledge and information, we pray that you'd help us to understand the essence of the faith that is once for all delivered to the saints. And we pray this in Christ's name, amen. Okay, we are in a study of 2 Peter chapter 1 and still in verse 1. And we're addressing this question, what is Christianity? We began this last week as part one, and tonight we're in part two, and next week will be part three, just so you know. That's, that should be it. I'm trying to cover all of this in three 
basics, okay, three very, very basic overviews of the uh, of what Christianity is. And as I began last time, I pointed out in Second Peter, uh, we have uh, the second part, actually, that Second Peter 1, 1, B, I think. To those who have obtained like precious faith with us, by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. And it is that phrase, like precious faith, where the word faith there indicates not the act of believing, but it is the, um, it is what is believed, the content of faith. It's used the same way in Jude chapter 3, where Jude challenges his readers to contend, to wrestle, to fight, to argue, to defend uh, earnestly the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Now, a couple of things we ought to note there in terms of the Jude comment is that he's looking at a body of doctrine that has been revealed and is a, a, set, con a, a set body of doctrine. And Peter is looking at it the same way. It is this, this faith that is common to all believers. It's the content, the body of faith. And that's why he will go ahead and warn his congregation, similar to the way Paul warned the elders of Ephesus to take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, also from among yourselves. So the enemies are outside the church and inside the church. Uh, from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch. So that's our responsibility. Take heed, watch. And that is a responsibility of the leaders of the church because there are false teachers that come in, whether they are believers or whether they are unbelievers, in order to distort the truth of Scripture. And so in 2 Peter 2.1, there's the warning that there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive Heresy. So false teaching is destructive. It destroys the truth. It destroys doctrine. It destroys confidence in God. It destroys confidence in the scripture. It destroys a, the, the principles for the spiritual life. And it often feeds the lusts of the sin nature, which wars against the soul and brings uh, self-destruction. So we're addressing this question, what is the body of doctrine we believe? What is it? What is this content? How do we define this? And I ran across this slide I made a few years ago that expresses basically what we looked at last time, that the foundation for understanding uh, the, what the Scripture teaches is our understanding of God. It doesn't start with Scripture, although that is where we get information about God, but it starts about the God who communicated that information, that he is a triune God, he is infinite, and he is personal. He is the one who breathes out Scripture. So God precedes Scripture. Scripture is described in 1 Corinthians chapter 2.16 as the mind of Christ, which would be the same as the mind of God. It expresses his thinking, his purpose for man, his plan for human history, his plan of salvation. And so Scripture is to be understood alone. It is not Scripture plus tradition. That is what you find in Roman Catholicism. That is what you find in Eastern Orthodoxy, whether it's Greek, Russian, Syrian, any of the Eastern Orthodox branches of Christianity. They have authority plus tradition, authority plus something else. And so we rely only on Scripture. Scripture is sufficient. That word sufficient means it is enough. doesn't need anything else added to it. It is all that is needed. And so we trust in the sufficiency of Scripture. And then the work of Christ. We talked about this last time under the 
category of redemption, that Christ has paid the penalty. He does this as a penal substitute. The word penal indicates the death is a punishment, and substitute emphasizes that he takes on this punishment on our behalf as our substitute. And the scripture teaches that we need this as human beings because we are born spiritually dead, separated from God. And so the only solution to spiritual death is then appropriating what Christ has done by faith alone in Christ alone. That's part of it. But, but this isn't the totality of what is necessary to uh, within Scripture within the body of truth that we believe. There is more to this. Some parts of this are more significant. The person and the work of Christ, which we're going to study tonight, is, of course, uh, very, very important. The gospel is very important. Understanding the nature of God is important, but it doesn't stop there. It goes on to address uh, some other areas. We started last time by looking at the fact that the foundation must be God, and that the foundation of every faith rests on some authority. Whether your faith, body of doctrine, is Islam, whether it's Buddhism, Confucianism, Hinduism, whether it's some secular philosophy, whether it's New Age mysticism, it all rests on some authority. It's either the authority of human reason, the authority of empiricism, the authority of mysticism, or the authority of an external revelation from an authority. And the Bible comes from God. He is the authority uh, given to us. And so we looked at God under four categories last time as he's uh, revealed in both the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, and in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, he is, it is emphasized that he is the creator God. He created all things by his words, by his speech. So that involves communication. And if you are going to communicate verbally, then there must be something on the part of the one you're communicating to that receives that information and can understand it. And it may be a matter of volition that they decide not to understand it, but the Creator God has communicated. God spoke, and everything came into existence. We have the Creator God, secondly, the emphasis on God as the holy God, the one-of-a-kind God, the totally distinct, set-apart God. He is unique and distinct from all of His creation. Second to that idea, it's not primary, but secondary to that idea is the idea of of God's righteousness and justice as being the source of morality or ethics. But morality in and of itself is insufficient. There are many people who are moral, but they have no relationship with God. The Pharisees were moral. There are cult groups that are moral, emphasize a strict ethic or morality. That is not spirituality. So the holy God emphasizes that God is the source of a true spiritual ethic of righteousness and justice. He is the redeeming God because man has sinned, man is spiritually dead, there must be redemption, there must be the payment of a price, the payment of the sin penalty, and as the redeeming God, he pays the penalty for sin for us. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. We were redeemed by his death, as we saw last time, uh, 1 Peter 1, 18 to 19, that we have been redeemed with the uh, precious blood of Jesus Christ. That is a metaphor for his death, his substitutionary penal death on the cross. And because the price has be been paid, God can forgive us. So he is the forgiving God. He is not just a just and righteous God. He is a loving, gracious, and merciful God who has provided for us. This is a chart. I developed some years ago to contrast the difference between the viewpoint of the Bible and the viewpoint of mankind apart from the Bible. Divine viewpoint is simply a term to express the unified view of the scripture as God expresses his views on everything in his creation 
through the written revelation of Scripture. Human viewpoint is man coming up with his ideas, his thinking, his opinions on how things ought to be apart from the objective revelation of God through Scripture. In divine viewpoint, God is a personal, infinite God. He is a triunity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And there is a black line here to indicate that he is totally set apart. He is totally distinct. He is not part of creation. He's not part of being, as it were, as a philosophical term. There's being and becoming. And that he created the universe. It's a finite universe. And man, animals, vegetation, matter, and energy were all created by God and are different from God. They are not the same. They did not come out of God, derive from God, emanate from God. All of those are terms that are used in various forms of philosophical religions where God is part of his creation. Now, what we see in the right-hand side is how human viewpoint, all human viewpoint systems break down into this diagram that you have not an infinite personal God, but an infinite impersonal universe. You have the Big Bang. What went bang? What went bang was uh, a dense block of matter. I understand that on the cutting edge of uh, evolutionary cosmology today that they are coming up with something new because they realize that, that it has some basic problems with the Big Bang. But you start off with this infinite impersonal universe. And then somehow within this whole structure, this whole side here just represents that infinite impersonal universe, God or the gods, man, nature, all f flow in what is called being. Okay, they all share uh, in this uh, structure of, of being. And so in the ancient world, you go back to Aristotle, Plato, Greek philosophers, you go back even further into more ancient uh, religious systems of the Babylonians and the Egyptians. Everything from the gods to the smallest part of, of, cre of nature is part of being. Some have more being than other things. But it's all part of the same thing. You have no creator-creature distinction. That's why I emphasize that, and that's the purpose of this chart, is this shows the creator-creature distinction. God is totally distinct and other from anything in his creation, whereas all other systems have God, man, and nature all sharing in the same being. Now, what I just said in the last three or four minutes is something that you'll probably take three or four semesters of graduate metaphysics to try to work through and everything, because that's the subject of, uh, I mean, that's the content of that, that particular subject. But it's important because this makes the God of the Bible so far beyond our comprehension and our understanding that we have to just trust in it. We can understand God to some degree, but we cannot understand him beyond that. We have to just believe the scriptures and trust him. So all of this describes the creator God, the holy God, the redeeming God, and the forgiving God, as we see described in the Old Testament and in the uh, New Testament as well. Second thing we saw last time is from this flows the authority of Scripture because God breathed out the Scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And I think it's interesting that when we look at our passage in 2 Peter, where he is talking about the fact that we have this precious faith, he is assuming that they understand this whole doctrine, this whole teaching on inspiration of Scripture that God breathed it out. It wasn't the thinking, the wasn't created by the prophets, didn't originate with the prophets, it originated with God. And they spoke, verse 21, uh, they spoke by the Holy Spirit. They were moved by God, the Holy Spirit. This is in contrast to 2 Peter 2.1, which is the next verse, that there were false prophets.
prophet. So there's always been this conflict be between those who submit to the authority of God and those who are making it up as they go along. 2 Timothy 3.16, literally all scriptures God breathed, not all scriptures inspired by God. So those were the first two. And then the third thing that we looked at last time was that Christianity is grounded on a specific declaration of redemption. Redemption, Christ paid the penalty for sin. Every time you see the word redemption, think of payment. Romans 3.23, the reason there needs to be payment is that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God or the essence of God, his holiness, righteousness, and justice. But in verse 24, we are justified freely by his grace through the redemption, that is the payment of the price that is in Christ Jesus. So the way that we apply that, as we looked at a few verses last time, is through John 3.3, 3, we must be born again or regenerated, that is by faith alone in Christ alone. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, again, Peter writing to the same people he's writing to in 2 Peter, recognizes they understand this teaching on redemption. So that's part of this like faith, this precious like faith, that they were redeemed not with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without spot or blemish. That Christ is in 1 John 2.2, 2, he himself is the propitiation for our sins. That word means he satisfied the righteousness and justice of God. Not for ours, that is not for ours as believers, but also for the whole world. He satisfied the justice and righteousness of God in paying the sin penalty for the entire world. And that is love. It's not a conflict between God's love and God's righteousness and justice, which human viewpoint always emphasizes that we have to love the criminal. And that means that we give up on righteousness and justice for the victim. That is typical of, human, of one form of human viewpoint thinking, is to emphasize love and juxtapose it to righteousness and justice, but in the perfect character of God, true love is going to also have perfect justice and righteousness. God's righteousness and justice are satisfied by the death of Christ. His righteousness is the standard of his perfect character. His justice is the application of his perfect righteousness. And so he, in righteousness, he must, the, the penalty for sin must be paid. And so because Christ paid the penalty, God's righteousness and justice are satisfied so that God's love is free to flow to mankind, and that's exhibited through a Savior. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And the way we apply that, the gospel, is clearly stated in John 20, 31, these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. We'll get into this again to, in our next section. And that by believing in him, in his name, you may have uh, eternal life. Believing is used twice here. Over 95 times in John, it's the only condition for salvation. Not believe and stay believing. Not believe and... Uh, reform your life, not believe and be faithful in going to church, but it is simply believing, trusting in Christ. One moment, instant in time, you trust in Christ. God in his omniscience knows what you're relying on, and you just need to do that once, and you're saved, and it can never be taken from you. John 3.18 says, he who believes in him is not condemned. He's not condemned because when you believe in Christ, you receive Christ's righteousness. And so you're not condemned because you have the perfect righteousness of Christ. You may be living unrighteously, but you possess and own the righteousness of Christ in your life. But he who does not believe is condemned already. Why? Because he is sp still spiritually dead and he is unrighteous and therefore he cannot enter into heaven. But he who does not believe is condemned already. Why? 
because he has committed certain sins? No, because those sins were paid for at the cross, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Here it is clearly stating Jesus is the Son of God. So that takes us to the third, third element in what constitutes Christianity. What is that body of doctrine? And it is, as I pointed out last time, it is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ our Lord. And so the question is, who is Jesus? See, in human viewpoint, Jesus is just a man. In some forms of this uh, heresy, you have Jesus is a man who received a divine impartation at either his physical birth or at the uh, uh, or at the baptism or maybe at the cross, sometime like that. He is not eternally the Son of God. He is not eternal undiminished deity. He he becomes God at some point in the Arianism named for its founder, a deacon in uh, the church in Alexandria in Egypt by the name of Arius, A-R-I-U-S. Arius taught there was a time when Christ was not. So Christ is a creature and he becomes God at some point in eternity past before the incarnation. But what the Bible affirms is that Jesus as the Christ Jesus as the Messiah must be both undiminished deity and true humanity, united together in one person. He is eternally undiminished deity. It's not diminished at all by the incarnation. He simply adds true humanity to his undiminished deity and willingly limits the use of his Uh, omni attributes, some of his other attributes during the period of his time on the earth so that he can live, walk among men and carry out his mission of salvation. Key verses, John 1.1, Colossians 1.18, Hebrews 1.3, and Philippians 2.5-12. Just remember John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1, and you'll get there. So we look at who is Jesus The next thing we're going to look at is who is the Holy Spirit. And then fifth, we'll look at the invisible realm, angels, Satan, and demons. So that's probably, if we get that far tonight, it will be miraculous, but we may do it. Uh, This is all important. Why? Because when we look at what Peter says in 1 Peter and 2 Peter, and what Jude Jude says in Jude, he alludes to these facts. He talks, both talk about the Holy Spirit. That's part of this body of faith that we have. It's clear that they understand that. They both talk about angels. They talk about Satan. They talk about demons. And so that is also part of this faith once for all delivered to the saints. So it is not, you know, some people want to reduce Christianity to just this basic understanding that it is, you know, Jesus saves, Jesus loves, and let's go love everybody else. And that is not what the scripture teaches. There's a lot more to it. Some of these basics are a little more fundamental to others, but they are all necessary, without which there is no biblical Christianity. Six, we will look next time at interpretation, how we interpret the Bible. That is fundamental, and that will lead to seven, which is understanding God's plan plan for the ages. We'll just do a very rough flyover of dispensationalism and what that means, and then God's plan for the future. If you don't have your interpretation in place, you won't get it right on seven and eight, and that will lead to some drastic errors, I think, in other aspects of doctrine or theology. Okay, so back to our third topic, who is Jesus, the undiminished deity and true humanity of of Jesus. Matthew 21.10. This takes place after the, what is known as the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Jesus comes in on what is traditionally known as Palm Sunday, and he enters in riding on the foal of a donkey in fulfillment of prophecy from Zechariah. And when he came into Jerusalem, Matthew says, all the city was moved, saying, 
Who is this? See, this is a vital question. Who is this? Who is Jesus? Who is this Jesus of Nazareth who's riding in and all the people are singing Hoshiana, praising God to the highest, Hoshiana meaning to meaning God save us, or begging God, or pleading with God to save or deliver us. And it references a recognition of Jesus as the Messiah. Earlier in his ministry, in Mark 8, 27, Jesus and his disciples uh, had been up north in Caesarea Philippi, and as they are walking, He's, or excuse me, he went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi. He's on his way from the Sea of Galilee up to uh, Caesarea Philippi, and he's going to have an object lesson there. And on the way, he says to his disciples, who do men say that I am? Who am I? Basic question. After they say, well, some say you're Elijah, some say John the Baptist, some say this, some say that. In Mark 8, 29... Peter answered and said, you are the Messiah. I think we lose some of the impact of that when we transliterate the Greek Christos into English and say you are the Christ because not everybody catches the fact that when you see the word Christ, you ought to be thinking Messiah because Christ is the Greek translation of the word uh, Mashiach, the Hebrew word Mashiach in the Old Testament. So this is really important. You are the Messiah. Well, how do you know the Messiah? What are the characteristics of the Messiah in the Old Testament? If you go back and you read Messianic prophecy, you can develop a pretty good idea of who this is, what he's going to look like, what his qualities, characteristics, uh, qualifications are going to be, and then you can identify this individual because he meets those qualifications. And so by this point, Peter has checked off all the characteristics, attributes, and qualifications, and he goes, it's, it's clear as a bell. You are the Messiah. Now, what, what are these qualifications? Let's just look at a few of them. This is very, very basic. There's a whole lot more that can be said about this, but I want to look at three particular passages that tell us something about the Messiah. These passages tell us that the Messiah is going to be more than human. These passages all teach that he is going to be human, truly human. He's born. That means he's human. He comes into this world through the natural, normal process of birth, just like every one of us. But it also teaches that the one who is born is eternal. Micah 5.2 is one of the more precise prophecies addressing the small town of Bethlehem founded by a man named Ephrata or Ephra, Ephrat, and so it's Bethlehem Ephrata, and this is just south of Jerusalem, about 10 miles or less, four or five miles, and Micah says, though you are little, in other words, though you're insignificant among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. So it's making a very clear statement here in Micah 5 2 that, that the one that will come forth is going to be the ruler. That is the Messiah. The Messiah was to come and to be the ruler. And in, I'm turning there right now, in Micah 5 2, Micah parallels, lived at the same time as Isaiah, says a lot there. In Micah, uh, 5 2 it says, Out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. I thought I'd left something out on this passage. I don't know why, why that got left off. Whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. That tells you he's eternal. How, he's born in, in Bethlehem, but he, his goings forth are from time everlasting, from eternity past. So he is both eternal and he is temporal. He's eternal in his deity, he's temporal in his humanity. Then we look at another passage, one we've discussed in many, many times in much detail, that uh, Isaiah the prophet has been uh, confronting Ahaz, an evil, wicked king in the southern kingdom of Judah, 
and his throne is being threatened. Now, he is a descendant of David, so the threat is really towards the house of David to destroy the lineage of David so the Messiah can't come. And a sign is going to be given, and this sign is a virgin birth. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. So actually, the emphasis in the text is on a virgin conception and not as much the virgin birth, but it's a virgin conception and birth. And so she is going to conceive through the normal process of conception, and she's going to give birth to a son. That is his humanity, his human body, his temporal body. And his name will be called Emmanuel. Emmanuel is a Hebrew word that means God with us. El means God. Im is the preposition for with. And the A-N-U is the preposition with us. So God with us. So it's clearly identifying this child that is born through this miraculous conception and birth is God, is fully God. Now this section, Isaiah 7 through Isaiah chapter 9, is called the Emmanuel section because it's all related to these prophecies about the Messiah who is going to come. In Isaiah 9, 6 we read, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. This is written in poetry. So the first two lines are what we call synonymous parallelism. The second line uh, basically repeats what is in the first line, but there are some differences. The child is born. This emphasizes the birth of the humanity of the Messiah. A son is given. That references the Son of God, the one who is in uh, Psalm 27 recognized and uh, announced by God as his son. And at the time that Jesus came, at uh, at his baptism and at the Mount of Transfiguration, God the Father announced, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So a son is given. That emphasizes the divine aspect. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and that emphasizes that he will rule over Israel. This was the destiny of the Messiah, the God-man who would be the perfect ruler and king reigning over Israel and reigning over the world. And then we have his names. Now, these names recognize his character. His name will be called Wonderful. Some English translations say Wonderful Counselor, but each of these terms is significant. Wonderful is a, uh, a, a description that is only given of God in the Scripture. So only God is wonderful. He is, he, he is someone, it's very close to being awesome. He is awe-inspiring. Wonderful, he is the counselor. He is the one who is able to give counsel because he is the source of all wisdom. And then we have the phrase, mighty God. He is mighty God. A clear declaration that of the deity of Emmanuel. And he is then called everlasting father. That term confuses people. There's a couple of different ways this has been explained. I think the best way is just to look at the Hebrew word. It is a compound word. It is aviad. Avi is the, av is father. The diminutive, the familiar form of av is uh, is Abba. And if you watch any of these shows on TV, that and go to Netflix and go to uh, Amazon Prime, there are a number of really outstanding productions that are done by uh, by the Israelis that that are there. You have to read through them because they're, they speak in Hebrew. But you'll notice that they will refer to their father as Abba. And that is like us calling our father Daddy. They don't do that in the north, but they do that in the south. You'll notice that southern men often refer to their father as Daddy. And that's the form. It indicates an intimacy. So Abba is the term for father, Av or Abba, Abba. And then it's connected to the second uh, word, ad, which indicates eternity. So it means father of eternity. That just basically means he's eternal. He's the father of eternity. He is the God over eternity. He is an eternal one. So he is God, he is eternal, 
and he's the Prince of Peace, again indicating that he is the ruler. So Isaiah 9.6 tells us, along with Micah 5.2 and Isaiah 7.14, that the Messiah is going to be fully human, enter into human history as a, as a man, he's, but he's also eternal and undiminished deity. He's going to be called the Son of God. In Hebrew, if you are, have a certain characteristic, you will be said to be the son of that characteristic. So you may be corrupt, so you'll be called the son of corruption. You may be a fool, so you'll be called the son of a fool. You may be a murderer, so you'll be called the son of a murderer. And all of those terms are just the way they express it. There's the adjective that is the characteristic, a murderer, fool, uh, corrupt, and you represent that. So you are a son of corruption, a son of the fool, son of a murderer. So if you are divine, you are the son of God. You, rep, you have divine characteristics. And this term is applied to Jesus 42 times in the New Testament. He is the son of God. It's interesting here, I put this verse in here, Matthew 26, 63, because this is in the midst of the trial of Jesus. And the uh, Sanhedrin is trying him on blasphemy charges, and Jesus is keeping silent in fulfillment of Isaiah 53, like a lamb before his shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. But Jesus kept silent, and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Now, if he asked that question, what he understood was that the Messiah was to be the Son of God. That's why he asks it that way. Tell us, are you the Messiah, the Son of God? They, thought, they understood from their study of the Old Testament that the Messiah was the Son of God. They're rejecting Jesus' claims to be the Son of God. In Mark 1.1, 1, 1, Mark introduces his gospel by saying the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ, the Son of God, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. John 3.18 says, he who believes in him, who's him? He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. We're introduced to that in John 3.16, for God loved the world in this way that he gave his only begotten son. That's where it's introduced, but we have the full title, Son of God, in John 3.18, indicating he is full deity. In John 9.35-37, to 37, this is an interchange between Jesus and the blind man that he had healed of blindness from birth, uh, earlier in the chapter. Now he was blind, he was healed, he goes off and the Pharisees try to trap him because among Pharisaical or rabbinical teaching, one of, the, one of several signs that was a clear sign of the Messiah was that he would heal a blind man. He would also raise somebody from the dead. This was considered to be impossible. If somebody had been born blind from birth, that no one could heal him other than an act of God, and that would be the Messiah. So after they have a confrontation because the Pharisees refuse to believe that, that he has been healed, then they cast him out. And so that's when this verse occurs. Jesus heard that they, that is the Pharisees, had cast him out, and when he had found him, so that means Jesus went looking for him, and he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? Now, who's Jesus talking about here? Verse 36, he, that is the blind man who now can see, he answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Again, all through here, the issue is believe, 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 and the object is always in the Son of God, in Jesus Christ, in the gospel. And Jesus said, you have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. So Jesus is clearly saying, I'm the Son of God. I'm the one you need to believe in. And if you believe in me, you have eternal life. In John eleven twenty seven, 27, when Jesus and his disciples come back to Bethany after Lazarus has been dead for four days and he's in the grave and Martha comes out to confront him, she said to him, yes, she, she comes up to him, she said, Lord, why did you wait so long? If you'd gotten here, you could have healed him. And 
Uh, Jesus uh, replies to her in the, in the order of, don't you trust me? Don't you believe that I am the resurrection? And she says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. So all of these indicate that the one who is Messiah is fully God, the Son of God. John 20, 31, John concludes his gospel by saying, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. It's very clear that essential to Christianity is an understanding of who Jesus is, that he is fully God and fully man, he's undiminished deity and true humanity united together in one person forever, and that he clearly claimed to be the Son of God. He was, uh, it was understood that he as Messiah was the Son of God, and he claimed to be the Messiah. The disciples recognized him as the Messiah, which is the same as saying you are the Son of God, because that was what was understood from the Old Testament. So when you get to modern human viewpoint, and they come along and say Jesus never claimed to be God, but their assumption is that the New Testament books were all written somewhere between 175 and 250 A.D., a hundred or more years after conservatives believed the Bible was written. Now, this is an important point, because when you're talking with some folks, they'll say, well, Jesus didn't say that. How do you know? These books were written much later, because I've got a Ph.D. in watching the Discovery Channel and the History Channel, and I know all about the truth of the Bible because I've listened to all these, you know, anti-Christian false teachers on television, and I'm the expert. And I have witnessed to people like this. And, and I have said, in fact, I have one person I witnessed to, and he's never talked to me about it again, because this, this was his line of defense, that the New Testament was written later. They really didn't know what Jesus said. I said, well, if that writ was written a hundred to 150 years later, how do you explain the fact that we have uh, archaeological remains of, of portions of sermons and letters that were written in the 80s or the 90s that are quoting from the Gospels? If those Gospels weren't written for another hundred years, how could, how could Clement of Rome have quoted for them? That's amazing. He quotes from a book that's not going to be written for another hundred years. How'd that happen? We, we, not only that, but we have, we have uh, letters that were written. We have scraps of sermons. We have uh, scraps of, of, uh, of scripture readings from the early church that were used in their, uh, in their worship services. In the, the, from the early church. And we have fragments of the Gospel of John as old as maybe 115, 117 A.D., some 20 to 25 years after John wrote it. Okay? So it's pretty clear that the New Testament was written in the first century just as it was claimed. And if you don't want to believe that, if you don't want to believe that, then there is a, uh, a liberal... Uh, a liberal professor who's also the author of the God is Dead philosophy who wrote a book on this, on, on the New Testament documents, and he had to admit on the basis of, of the, um, on the basis of archaeological evidence and remains and everything, that all of the New Testament was written before 60. Wait a minute. Conservatives don't even say that. We believe that there are several parts of the New Testament that were written in the 60s and the 70s. John did not write the, the, uh, probably his epistles and the Gospel of John and, and Revelation until the late 80s or 90s. So he went even, uh, even further in his claims. So you have liberal scholars who admit that, uh, objectively, that on the basis of evidence, all of the New Testament was written before uh, the end of the first century. And so you can't escape it by saying this was all made up about Jesus some 100 or 150 years, years later. Uh, John wrote. John was an eyewitness. Matthew wrote. Matthew was an eyewitness. Mark wrote. He's writing down Peter's account. Peter was an eyewitness. Uh, Luke interviewed a whole bunch of eyewitnesses and wrote down their, uh, their account. So he is the Son of God. Second title that's used is he's the Son of Man. This comes out of the Old Testament, Daniel 7.13. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man 
coming with the clouds of heaven. Often that is a metaphor for the angels. He came to the Ancient of Days. This is God the Father. And they brought him near before him. Now what's happening here is this is a vision of Daniel. What's going to happen at the end of this period we refer to as the tribulation. This is the period of Jacob's trouble, the period of Daniel's 70th week, which is described in Daniel chapter 9. It is when all of the kingdoms of man on the earth come together in their fiercest form at the end of days, and then uh, the Son of Man is going to be sent by the Father. This is the scene. He comes to the Father, he's the Ancient of Days, and he will be dispatched to destroy the kingdoms of man. He's called the Son of Man, so this is a messianic title. In Matthew 9, 6, Jesus says, but that so, you, so that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. So he's claiming for himself to be the Son of Man, and because he's the Son of Man, he can forgive sins, which is an act only God can do, because sin is only against God. He heals the paralytic, but to show that he's forgiven him, he says, take up your bed and walk. Take up your bed, go to your house. And he's basically saying, is it easier to say, hey, pick up your bed and go home, or is it easier to say your sins are forgiven? Well, nobody can see or validate whether somebody's sins are actually forgiven. So it's easier to say that. So Jesus says, okay, so I'm going to validate that I can forgive sins. I'm going to tell him to get up and walk. He's going to get up and walk. He's healed of his paralysis. Later in Matthew 16, we read Jesus saying, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels. That's talking about the clouds coming, coming with the clouds in Daniel chapter 7 that I just read, for the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. That's Daniel 12, 2. So he's clearly making a claim that he is this messianic figure, the Son of Man, who's going to come with the angels, and after he comes there will be the end-time judgment, making a claim for deity. But the term Son of Man emphasizes his humanity, just like the Son of God emphasized his deity. So he is the son of God, he is the son of man, and he is the son of David. The son of David is, um, comes from the Davidic covenant that God promised to David, which we've been studying on Tuesday nights for some time, 2 Samuel 7, uh, 12 and 13. God promises that a descendant of David will be eternal. He will have his kingdom established. It will be an eternal kingdom, an eternal throne, and an eternal house or dynasty. So the only way that can happen is if your line culminates in somebody who is eternal. That is the son of David. Uh, David's father's name was Jesse. Isaiah 11.1 1 has another um, prophecy. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. Not a great translation. It's a stem. Uh, it's a stem from the root of Jesse. Jesse, the picture here is of a tree that's being cut down, and it looks like it's dead. It looks like the house of David is over with, but now a new shoot is coming forth. And that shoot is the son of David. Okay, so it's messianic. He is the branch. A branch shall grow out of his roots. That is the root of Jesse, who's the father of David. And then in verse 10 it says, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. And that's referring to his kingdom, glorious kingdom. So he's the son of God, he's the son of man, he is the son of David. He is clearly in the New Testament full undiminished deity. In the beginning was the word. Now the Greek is much more graphic than the English. It's basically saying at the time that you would mark the beginning of time, the beginning of creation, the beginning of all things, the word already was existing. It's an imperfect tense in the Greek, continuous action in the past. The word was already existing, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Clearly identifying the word, the term logos, as relating to uh, full deity. Later, in verse 12, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory the glory is of the only begotten of the Father. 
In Colossians 1.16, we read, For by him, and in context, that's Jesus, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. So creation is attributed to Jesus. Uh, the creation of the angels, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, see, all was created by Jesus. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him or by him all things consist. This is why all of those horrible predictions about global warming and ecological disaster are false, is because Jesus Christ holds everything together. And the instant he breaks his concentration, it just evaporates, everything would just turn into nothingness. But Jesus Christ controls everything, and man is not nearly great enough, and no matter what he does, even in the worst nuclear atrocity, Jesus Christ controls it and won't destroy mankind or history or anything else. So we have to just trust in Christ. Colossians 2, 9, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. How else can you say he's fully God? In him, in this, in his humanity dwells all the fullness. Everything that makes God God is in that corporeal human body. Hebrews 1, 3 says, he talking about Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory. He is the effulgence of his glory and the express image of his person, of God's person. He is God. He is fully God. Uh, human language can only go so far in making these things clear. And he upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Clearly talking about Jesus as the express image of God's character. And in our passage that we're studying in 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, at the end of the verse it says, He is, uh, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us, by the righteousness of who? Our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Now we'll get into this once we finish figuring out what the body of content of our faith is. The, our God and Savior is, according to the um, uh, Granville Sharp rule, you have one article that governs two nouns that are not proper nouns. Now, in English, God is a proper noun, but in Greek, God was not a proper noun. And how do you know the difference between... I'm getting ahead of myself here because I've already studied this, but a proper noun is not made into a plural. You have somebody whose name is Dave. Make that a plural. See, you can't. It's a proper name. The White House. You know, it's one place. You can't make it a plural. A proper noun can't be made a plural. But there is such a word as theoi, gods. It's a plural. So it's not a proper noun. So Savior is not a proper noun. We capitalize this because it's referring to God in English. So you have one article governing, governing two uh, common nouns, God and Savior, indicating they are the same person. A clear example of the Granville Sharp rule. And you see it again in, verse, in chapter 3, verse 18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Lord and Savior are identical. Jesus Christ is clearly stated at the beginning and at the end of Second Peter as being fully God. Now it tells us this is part of that like precious faith. It's part of this thing. We have to understand this. That if you reject the undiminished eternal deity of Jesus Christ, your heretic. If you reject the hypostatic union of deity and humanity in Jesus, you reject the virgin birth, you're a heretic. You're not a Christian. You're not a biblical Christian. You're making it up as you go along, but you're not a Christian. Another term that is applied to Jesus a lot is the term Savior. He is a Savior, for there is born to you this day in the city of David. He, why was he born in the city of David in Bethlehem? Because he's a descendant of David. He's a son of David. There is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Mashiach, our Lord. In Philippians 3.20, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is our Savior. 2 Timothy 1.10, The appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ. We believe Jesus is the only way to salvation. As Paul 
I mean, excuse me, as Peter says in Acts 4.12, there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus is our Savior. He is the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in 2 Peter 2.20. He is the Lord and Savior in 2 Peter 3.2. And he's the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in 2 Peter 3.18. All of that tells us that Jesus is, has to be this one identified in the Old Testament is the Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us. He is fully God, and he is fully man. Undiminished deity and true humanity united together. Now, when we go back to this chart I put together, Christ, being fully God and true humanity, allows him to be our substitute because he is a lamb without spot or blemish. He has no sin. Therefore, he can die in the place of mankind because he is God. What he does has an eternal, infinite value so that he can pay the substitute for all mankind. Okay, now that took a lot longer than I thought it would, and we only covered the aspect related to Christ. We'll come back next time to look at the issue of God the Holy Spirit as well as the... Um, the spiritual life, and then the supernatural realm that is angels, Satan, and demons. These are fundamental to the body of truth that we believe as Christians. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study through who our Lord Jesus Christ is. This remarkable combination of undiminished deity and true humanity in that one person goes beyond the scope of our full comprehension. But we know it's true. He is tr truly God and truly man. Very God and very man, as the, as the uh, creeds have stated in summarizing this vital truth. And without this, there is no salvation because there is not a Savior. And Father, it is clear testimony, Old Testament, New Testament, that the Messiah is fully God and fully man and that he is to be the Savior of the world. Father, we pray that you'd help us to understand all of this as we press forward to see the other aspects of what are the fundamentals of the Christian faith. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.